Okay, great. Thank you for that. Welcome to the uh, South Atlantic board, everyone. Thank you, Cody and team for getting everybody organized and sound checked. Um, okay, so we have a pretty full agenda. We have uh, three action items to get done today and we have until 345 to do it. So hopefully all will go smoothly. Um, our, our first uh, order of business is board consent uh, with approval of the agenda. And with that, I wanted to um, forward to the board that the fourth action item listed on the agenda was to elect a vice chair. However, uh, you may be aware that there is an item before the executive committee this meeting. Uh, it is a proposal to divide this board in two. Um, so the proposal is to alter the agenda to remove that item until a final decision is made by the policy board as to whether we're going to uh, remain as one board or continue on as two. So with that, I'll ask if there is any, um, if anyone else has any need to modify the agenda. If you do, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands, Lynn. Okay, and I am going to ask to approve the agenda by consent. If anybody does not approve the agenda, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands. Great. And then uh, has, if, hoping everybody's had a chance to review the meeting summary from February. That was a meeting summary. The meeting did not record, so it was um, it was not a transcript. Uh, does anybody have any modifications that they desire to put into the February meeting summary? If so, raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, and if, is there any opposition to approval of the meeting summary? I don't see any opposition. Great, thanks, Tony. And before we move to public comment, I think I was remiss. I should just introduce myself a little better. My name is Lynn Fegley. I am the administrative um, commissioner. I proxy for my boss, Bill Andrews, on this board representing the state of Maryland. Um, so that's that. And next, is there anybody out there who has public comment? If you do, please raise your hand. And if any members of the public don't know how to raise your hand, you click on the little button that is the, shaped like a hand and it'll raise your hand. And if you're having trouble with that, you could also send us a chat or a question. I don't see any hand raised, Lynn. Okay, all right, seeing none. So the first uh, action item today, and just to remind everybody, um, I will be looking for a motion at the end of this discussion, and it is to consider draft addendum one to amendment one um, for approval for public comment. So this is the point where we send it out to comment for hearings to happen um, over the next couple months. And I believe that Mike Schmidtke is going to take us through um, through the, the draft addendum. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna Go ahead and make myself presenter. Okay, does every, uh, do you see my lead screen uh, for the draft addendum one presentation? I can see it, Mike. Okay, great. All right. So today we're going to be going through draft addendum one to amendment one to the COBIA FMP uh, with consideration for public comment. This draft addendum addresses uh, four different issues ranging from commercial and uh, recreational and commercial allocations, a, an adjustment to the commercial trigger calculation method, and then uh, consideration of some alternative de minimis measures. So as I go through the presentation today, first I'm going to go through a bit of an, uh, an overview of the timeline that has uh, brought us to this point. Um, then I'll give a brief introduction of the four issues that we'll be going through and then go through the issues one by one. As I go through each of those issues, 
I'll present a slide or two of background information that is relevant to that specific issue, uh, then present the management options that are being proposed by the plan development team, and then I'll pause after, e after presenting each of those sets of options uh, for some issues, specific questions, and comments, and discussion by the board if, uh, if you all have any alterations to those. After going through all four of those issues, then um, I'll also pause for some uh, overall questions, comments, discussions, if there's uh, something that any of the board members want to talk about from a larger perspective related to the addendum document. So in regards to the timeline, uh, if you all will remember at the last board meeting in February of this year, uh, the board initiated this draft addendum. Since then, the plan development team has been uh, working on the document. Uh, we had a little bit of a delay due to uh, COVID-19 and travel restrictions and all of that, so it got pushed from the spring meeting uh, back to the summer meeting where we are now. Um, but now we're, we're bringing it up and uh, having the board consider draft addendum one for approval for public comment. If approved for public comment today, then there would be a time period for written comment as well as public hearings in between now and the October meeting. And the October meeting would be when the board would come back to consider the document for final approval. Looking back to that February meeting, um, among many things that happened in that meeting, it was a long one, but one of the things that happened was uh, CDAR 58 stock assessment for Atlantic Cobia was presented to the board. This stock assessment was the first for Cobia to incorporate the new MRIP, recre the new MRIP recreational catch estimates based on the, the mail-based fishing effort survey and transitioning from the coastal household telephone survey. If you all will remember, uh, those estimates were significantly higher uh, using the, the, new, the new FES estimates rather than the telephone estimates. So that led to larger population estimates. And uh, as you'll see in that second, that second bullet point, a larger quota than what we were uh, previously working, working under. At the February meeting, the board also specified a new total annual harvest quota of about 80,000 fish, and this was based off of the projections from the CDAR 58 model. Under Amendment 1 allocations, this total quota is allocated 92% to the recreational fishery and 8% to the commercial fishery. A reminder about uh, Amendment 1 and how uh, how we manage the recreational fishery. There was a bit of a change in Amendment 1 where uh, the board decided to move from managing the recreational fishery in terms of a poundage and moving to numbers of fish. So you'll notice that uh, those different units are reflected throughout the presentation. The previous quotas that had been set were a total quota of 670,000 pounds uh, with 620,000 to the recreational and 50,000 to the commercial. And with such a significant increase to the quota, one of the big questions that came out of that discussion was whether the quota increase that was being seen was uh, only due to the MRIP calibration and in effect leading to a de facto reallocation of the fishery in the direction of of the commercial side. So in response to that question, among a few others in follow-up, the board initiated draft addendum one, and one of the requests that was made was uh, for options for a reduced commercial quota percentage that would offset impacts of the increased recreational catch estimates. And uh, the PDT attempted to address this request through issue one and the options shown there. The board also uh, requested in some of the follow-up discussions reconsideration of some of the de minimis measures that are uh, that are used for COBIA, and those are addressed in issues three and four, one for the commercial and one for the recreational side. And then after the board meeting in February, uh, one of the one of the steps in the harvest specification process for COBIA 
is that a commercial trigger is calculated um, and that is used in any type of commercial closure that would occur within a season. And the COBIA Technical Committee would normally calculate this commercial trigger and uh, submit it for the board's consideration and approval. However, when the Technical Committee uh, attempted to do this using the methods described in Amendment 1, it was not able to be calculated uh, due to the large increase in the commercial quota. There will be a little bit more discussion along those lines uh, when, when I get to that issue as well as later on when Angela presents uh, the TC's recommendation. Uh, but there was a memo distributed from the TC describing this issue back in May and the board uh, via email consent directed the plan development team to include revising the method for calculating the commercial trigger into draft addendum one. And it's a little bit out of order numerically, but that's uh, that's addressed in issue two of the document. So now I'll be moving uh, into issues one through four, going through one by one and starting off with issue one, which deals with uh, the allocation. So the two really long equations that you see on the screen, and those are also in the uh, draft addendum one document, those are from the Coastal Migratory Pelagics FMP from the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Uh, this is back when the when cobia were being managed, when Atlantic cobia were being managed by the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, and these are the equations that were used to come up with the 92% and 8% allocations that are used in the current fishery. Uh, these percentages came from data that were uh, from recreational harvest data from 2000 through 2008 with additional weight being put on harvests in 2006 through 2008. And obviously the 92% and 8% uh, resulted from that. So when the PDT, when we got together and we were uh, discussing what potential alternatives would be to the current allocation, the first thing that, uh, that we tried was just simply plugging in the recalibrated numbers, the new FES numbers from 2000 through 2008. And uh, I came up with the result shown on the screen, uh, about 2.5% for the commercial, 97.5% for the recreational. Now, looking at how those played out into poundage and uh, number of fish for those, for those different sectors, uh, we did notice that on the commercial side, if we were to just put those straight in as is, then there would be a decrease, a slight decrease to the commercial quota. Uh, and this would be happening at a time when the recreational quota is undergoing a significant increase and there's also uh, a stock that is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. So in light of, uh, in light of that information and where the quota has been recently, the PDT kind of started from the baseline that, uh, the increase to the recreational quota shouldn't lead to a decrease in the commercial and that the options that uh, the PDT would propose would allow at least 50,000 pounds for the commercial fishery. Additionally, the PDT didn't uh, want to get into trying to allocate by fractions of a percent. So uh, for the baseline option, uh, we just rounded up that 2.6 to 3% and that kind of put us over the threshold for that 50,000 pounds, and you'll see that when we get to the, the management options. Uh, but once we put that in place, uh, then we kind of stepped up by single percentages for a couple of alternatives. So we have options for 3% commercial allocation, 4% and 5%. After, uh, after that decision really was made, um, just kind of being honest about the timeline, uh, we got information from uh, from NOAA kind of addressing, from M, excuse me, MRIP specifically uh, addressing the question that the board had asked at the previous meeting of what, uh, one of the questions was what would the 620,000 pound recreational quota look like if it were in FES units? And we asked, uh, we had asked MRIP for that conversion and 
Uh, I imagine they had uh, quite a bit on their plate with uh, with COVID-19 and a lot of the, the restrictions from that, but we did get that information after we kind of formulated the options. And um, what it ended up being was shown on your screen, it's shown as the 2019 quote of the FES approximation. Um, one of the things to note about this, uh, well, there are a couple things, but uh, one of them initially to note about this is this is not considered uh, an official MRIP cali calibration or conversion because they weren't converting a harvest from one year. They were converting what we put forward as a quota. And in other instances where they calibrated the harvest, they had additional information such as harvest by region and information about effort that went into the calibration, whereas this, we just gave them a number and they looked at the time period uh, under which that quota was in place and they used that information, had to make some assumptions. But this is about uh, what it would translate to is 1.36 million. When converting that poundage into number of fish using the same average weight um, that was considered when the current 2020 quotas were were formed, uh, which was the 2016 through 18 recre uh, recreational average weight, that translates to about 41,000 fish. So that column on the right is somewhat of a translation of that old quota into new FES units. Um, and when reading this table, uh, one other thing to note is that the top line under the, in the recreational row the top line that is not in parentheses are the uh, units that would have impacted management or hypothetically would have impacted management, whereas the parentheses are uh, the alternative uh, converted units into either pounds into fish or fish into pounds, about what those translate into. So uh, the big takeaway from all this is that the increase to the quota does not seem to be solely due to the MRIP conversion. There does seem to be uh, some increase to the actual number of fish that uh, are uh, available and allowable for harvest under the new 2020 quota. And where that comes into play, uh, I talked about the timeline of how these options were developed, but where that actually comes into play is that with the options that are presented here for issue one, uh, there are a couple of different backgrounds and there's some, some level of numeric basis for um, a few of the different strategies that the board could take going from here moving forward. So option A is uh, the status quo option, maintaining the 92 and eight uh, allocations that are in place right now. Option B is kind of that baseline that the PDT worked off of, the, uh, the lowest whole percentage that would allow at least 50,000 pounds of harvest. And then skipping option C for the moment down to option D, what option D ended up being, um, we found this from uh, from looking at that that MRIP FES approximation, is that is an option that is about as close as we're going to get with whole percentage numbers to a proportional increase on both sides of the fishery. Um, if you compare that FES number, uh, that 41,000 fish number uh, from the FES approximation to option D. It's between an 80 and 90% increase. It's an 80, about 87% increase. Whereas looking at the commercial quota going from 50,000 pounds up to 91,000 pounds is about an 82% increase. So we're in a similar ballpark and that's probably uh, just because of the disparity in, uh, in, the, in the amount allocated to one fishery or the other. Uh, that's about as close as as we would probably get to a proportional increase in both sides, both of them going up by about 85 or so percent. So, uh, and then option C, coming back to that, option C is an intermediate option in between B and D, um, where there's increase to both uh, both sectors of the fishery, but the recreational increase is larger than that of the commercial. So depending on what the board wants to prioritize with the management of this species, um, 
I know there are there's definitely been some input uh, when we spoke to the AP about these options. There was input from the AP that they uh, that their impression was that at least some of the members there, their impression was that uh, Cobia was being managed, um, you know, as a primarily uh, recreational species, which is still accomplished in all of these options um, as the recreational percentage is only going up. Uh, but there was uh, some preference for option B from some members of the AP there. But um, regardless, there are a few different strategies for the board to consider. And at this point, I can pause and uh, take questions if there are any or um, hear any comments or discussion. All right. Thanks, Mike. Are there any questions for Mike on what he just presented? I don't see any hands, Len. Okay. Well, I have one. Um, so I just wonder, I don't recall, Mike, that's actually really interesting information on option D, that that is the sort of the proportional increase for both sectors. Is that, that's not explicitly stated in the addendum right now, is it? It is not in the addendum right now. Um, and one of the reasons why is because somewhat of the, you know, the timing with which we got it and the timing of uploading the document, but also I'm, because that is not a definitive MRIP calibration, that was something that I discussed with, uh, with some of the MRIP staff, was that it wasn't a, uh, a an official MRIP calibration. It was oh. an approximation that was provided to us at our request. That's one of the reasons why I would rather talk about it, you know, speak about it here, providing caveats, as opposed, and this is something that can be included, I, I would think, in discussions following here at public hearings. But I don't know that it's a number that MRIP would feel comfortable putting into a document. Okay, understood. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so, and still no questions, correct? Correct. All right, so we will um, move right along to the next section, Mike. Okay, thanks. So next, moving to issue two, dealing with the commercial trigger. Uh, I talked about this a little bit, and you'll hear about this at least one more time from Angela, but um, when the COBIA TC uh, went into looking at the amendment one method, uh, that method was the, is, well, is the average number of days um, from the last three years for harvest to go from trigger percentage to the full non-de minimis portion of the quota. Uh, and the trigger percentage is to be calculated to allow at least 30 days from the trigger to the quota. The problem that the TC ran into when trying to calculate that percentage was what if the harvest either does, uh, doesn't reach the quota or the trigger? And this could be due to low harvest in a preceding time period before that, uh, that trigger is calculated. Excuse me. Or it could be due to a greatly increased quota, which was the case uh, for the 2020 specification. So the TC met and discussed this issue and recommended an adjusted method. Um, this was uh, a method that's really in similar spirit to what was trying to be accomplished through Amendment 1, but is done in a more flexible way. Uh, so what they proposed, and it, it was in the memo that was circulated in, uh, I believe, briefing materials, uh, that they would calculate the average daily harvest rate from the last five years. They did change the time period from three to five years. Um, and then uh, calculating the trigger harvest level, um, that would be the non-de minimis quota uh, and minus 30 times the average daily harvest rate. So the average daily harvest rate being about uh, a day's worth of harvest and they would be taking off 30 days worth of harvest from the non-de minimis quota. Uh, just reminding of the plan, non-de minimis states are the only ones that are required to track their landings within the season. Uh, the de minimis states have a set aside portion of the commercial quota that uh, that's not that's not brought into this so that we can uh, we can accurately track those landings against the quota 
and not risk overfishing as much. Um, and the advantage of this method is that it can be calculated regardless of what the harvest level has been relative to the quota uh, because it's reduced down to that daily harvest rate. So the options that are put forward uh, in addendum one are option A of a status quo, um, which uh, just kind of read through that method before, but it would require some alterations in years like this. And um, and one of the one of the notes is that within the Cobia TC's memo, they did request uh, they did request that that alternative method be used in 2020, and that's something that Angela will uh, will get to in when she speaks. Um, option B is the TC recommended method uh, for calculating the commercial trigger. So I, I think I've pretty much explained both of those methods at this point, and I can pause once again uh, for any questions, comments, discussion. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. All right, so if we have um, no questions there, I get, so we have, I think, two more issues to go over. So carry on, Mike. Okay, thank you. Next issue is looking at the uh, commercial de minimis regulations. So uh, as a reminder for COBIA, de minimis status, uh, that applies to states with small COBIA fisheries, small being defined as on the commercial side, less than 2% of the coastwide landings, and on the recreational side, less than 1% of the coastwide of the coastwide landings. So for issue three, under the commercial de minimis measures, with the current quota of about 146,000 pounds, uh, 3%, the 3% de minimis set aside is 4,387. And there was uh, some concern about, with an increasing quota, that uh, the amount of set aside harvest for de minimis states would become basically more than what the de minimis states are actually going to harvest. Uh, commercial harvests in de minimis states, looking back to 2000, range from 48 pounds to 4,477 pounds with an average of uh, 1991. So uh, it, in many of those years, they weren't harvesting that full amount of set aside. One thing to note when it comes to that de minimis set aside is that it is not a quota. It's not something, you know, if the de minimis states reach that level of harvest, then the fishery gets shut down or anything like that. It is meant to be an approximation of what the de minimis states are harvesting. So that portion of the quota is not accessible to the non-de minimis states who are tracking their harvest within the season. So the the idea that the PDT was working under was to cap the de minimis set aside at amounts that uh, that the harvest is not likely to hit or doesn't hit frequently. So looking at the options that were put forward, the status quo is to just maintain the flat three percent of the commercial quota as the set aside. Option B is to cap the commercial quota at 3,000 pounds, so it would still be 3% as long as that 3% is less than 300, is less than 3,000 pounds. But if 3% of the commercial quota exceeds 3,000 pounds, uh, then 3,000 would be the set aside. And similar type of thing for option C, except the cap would be 5,000 pounds. Uh, the reasoning for the two numbers that were chosen. 3,000, um, it was somewhat ad hoc, but if you look at the addendum document in table two, you can see uh, that harvest by the de, by the uh, de minimis and non-de minimis states, the non-de minimis ones are only Virginia through South Carolina, all other states qualify for de minimis. Um, but looking at the, at the 
de minimis harvests over those years, most years they are less than 3,000 pounds. Um, somewhat ad hoc, but it was just kind of a number where it was uh, most years they, they fall in that category. And then option C, in all years, that was the kind of the lowest thousand pound uh, mark where they fall under that in all years during the recent time period going back to 2000. So those are the, the options put forward for issue three, and I'll pause here uh, for questions, comments, discussion. Okay, questions on option, uh, issue three. Don't see any hands raised, Lynn. Okay, let's do issue four, recreational de minimis. Okay, thanks. And one one note I did forget to mention for issue three, I did notice when making the presentation that table three, uh, table three presents what, uh, what the de minimis set aside would be under each of the issue one options. And I did not have the option D listed in that table, but that has been uh, updated, at least in the document that I've been keeping. And that will be updated in the copy of the document that goes out for public comment. Next, moving into the final issue, recreational de minimis, or the recreational fishery, the FMP, allows de minimis states uh, to have regulations that would copy kind of a nearest neighbor, um, either a neighboring state or the nearest non-de minimis state and match those. And that in effect is Virginia because all of the recreational de minimis states are those that are north of Virginia. And all of those states have opted for that option of uh, copying Virginia's regulations. But there is an alternative that is allowed in the plan for those states to choose management uh, using a 29 inch fork length minimum size and one fish vessel limit with no seasonal restriction. Uh, so their fishery would be open year round, the recreational fishery that is. That 29 inch size was based off of 50% maturity of female cobia uh, from the CDAR 28 assessment with um, the CDAR 58 assessment, uh, that information seemed to be updated a bit. Um, there is noted that uh, that there are limited samples below 33 inches, which is um, you know below the the legal size for the commercial fishery. Because of that, there is uncertainty about size at maturity that is involved in these data. So uh, not trying to be strict on the numbers for maturity within these sizes, but this is the information that we have from CDR 58. Um, it was observed that there were there was 33% female maturity for 23 and a half to 29 and a half inches, uh, about 60% maturity for 29 and a half to 31 and a half inches, and 100% female maturity above 31 and a half inches. And uh, these these numbers came into play when considering alternatives. Um, it was also brought to the PDT's attention that 29, 29 inches for cobia is a bit of a unique limit, um, which could potentially lead to confusion among anglers. Uh, it's not really uh, associated with the 33 or 36 that are used in other areas of management. So the alternatives that were developed were done so to in, uh, increase the percent mature at recruitment to the fishery and possibly connectivity to other limits that are currently in place. So the PDT developed two alternatives. The status quo is uh, the 29 inch fork length minimum size limit. Option B is a 31 inch fork length minimum size limit and that would fall into the category from CDR 58 where there's about 60% female maturity uh, within that size range. And then option C uses a 33 inch fork length minimum size limit. That is uh, the same minimum size limit as the commercial fishery. It also falls into the category from a, per, a percent mature perspective for female cobia. It falls into the category of 100% mature female fish. So all the fish that would be of legal size under option C 
would be mature female. If they are female, they would be mature cobia. So those are the options that were developed for issue four. And I'll pause once more for questions, comments, or discussions. Okay, any questions on issue four, recreational de minimis? I don't see any, Lynn. Okay, so <laughs> I think, and Mike, that winds up your presentation on the addendum, right? Yes, I was just gonna move one slide just for general questions, comments. So there we go. Lynn, I do have a hand up. Um, the Doug Heyman's and or Spud Woodward, they're in the room together, so. Okay, Spud or Doug, with, go, go on. Yeah, the Georgia delegation has a question. Okay. Uh, and, and Mike, forgive me, but I wanna back up to opportunities where we have to ask questions on both issues one and three, and I'll tackle three first. I mean, so would, would, would you mind just covering one more time, you used the word unmonitored, right? So even in the de minimis states, are they not reporting commercial catch? And I understand it's, it's required annually in the compliance report, but doesn't it still come in? No, for the de minimis states, they don't they don't report catch during the season. Like this season, this this year right now, I'm getting weekly reports from uh, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, because those are the non de minimis states. But I'm not getting any reports from other states because all the other states qualify for de minimis. No, no, I I, I understand that. What I mean is the the, the information is collected. Through trip yes. page, right? And, yes. And if it yes. Were, yeah, so I mean, we could change this so that they did have to report. I missed the, the word unmonitored is a bit, to me, a bit misleading to the public because they are monitored. They simply don't have to report. And, and I'm just curious as to whether the public will understand that when it goes through. Yeah, I, I'm going to weigh in on that this is lynn I, I agree that the word unmonitored coming from a de minimis state you know our our fishermen are required by law to report they do report except they don't report um you know at the frequency their, their reports come in on monthly log books uh and they're not compiled till the end of the season so it is a monitored fishery it's just not monitored uh, at the level for in-season management, and we wouldn't have the resources to make that happen in, in Chesapeake Bay. So, so I, this one. sorry, if if I change the wording, if we edited the wording to monitored within the season, would that work or no? We think that would make it a bit clearer to the public, or at least clearer to the Georgia delegation, sure. So, Lynn, just to make sure I understood what you just said, your commercial folks are required to report those, but they're not required to report on a monthly basis by the 10th of the following month or whatever period? It, they are, yes, they are, but, you know, you figure those reports come in and then they're keyed in so that the, the, the state doesn't have the compiled data you know, until at least probably at best two months and more on an average of four months after the report is submitted. If if you're fishing in the ocean and you're and you're bringing your fish through federal dealers, then that data arrives much faster because the de the, fed the federal dealers are reporting, you know, electronically. But the bay fisheries is coming in on paper, so we just can't do the in season monitoring where those numbers of the harvest coming from the bay could be incorporated you know into monitoring the the quota toward a closure if that makes sense that, that, that makes absolute sense i got it now. thank you so then mike i have one more question about issue one if you would back up to your last slide on issue one please uh go back one more. One. There you go. 
Would, would you? I, I apologize, I didn't catch it all, but the increase of quota does not seem solely due to MRIP conversion. Would, would you mind giving me the idiot's version of that, please? Sure. So the number that you see on the right, we went to uh, we went to MRIP and we requested, is there any way that you could convert 620,000 pounds of recreational quota and tell us what that quota would have been if the FES number, like if it were applied as an FES number? And that's what they came back with on the right. Now, like I said, it's an approximation. It is not a definitive MRIP calibration because it is a quota, it is a single poundage number that we gave them. We didn't give them, you know, poundage by state and and effort information throughout the time, like all those other things that go into their full on calibrations, which is one of the reasons why they specifically said, you know, that this is an approximate estimate, it is not an official MRIP calibration and it's not included in the document as such, but it gives a ballpark and seeing such a large discrepancy that there is potentially 80% more quota from what there would have been had, you know, in 2019 and under that 620,000 pounds, um, what the quota would have been there if they had been using FES units instead of the telephone survey units in mo in setting that quota. Um, just seeing that type of difference would indicate that it's very unlikely that the increase to quota was solely due to the change in MRIP. You're mixing your apples and oranges here. Does that answer your your question, Doug? Uh, the delegation doesn't. It still isn't quite clear. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're willing to continue you on. I don't know that we'll ever be quite clear on that, but okay. <laughs> All right. I think I've seen a question from Adam Nowelski. Great. Thank you very much. Is there any other justification for options C and D other than these are the quotas that would uh, result in remaining within the range of landings within the given time period and equate to a rounding of the percentage? I, I mean, I appreciate the simplicity of that approach, and there's certainly many other things uh, I've seen from management that we've considered uh, that are uh, we do often wish were as simple as that, uh, but I'm just concerned that that's somewhat arbitrary. If there's any other uh, basis that staff use in coming up with that and something that would be suitable for addition to this document before it goes out to the public. So options C and D really were I mean, they, they were, the approach for coming up for these alternatives was ad hoc in the nature of, we had a baseline from option B and we wanted to provide some additional alternatives. I mean, if we wanted, you know, if the board wanted to, because we're within the range of options, C and D, even if they were deleted, could still be considered. But uh, the PDT felt like if, there if there were if there was a chance that somebody wanted the commercial quota to increase beyond that 50,000 mark then they would put that option in it could be considered and uh, it would be up to the board if you all would want to take it further uh, but it was really just stepping up single percentages uh, adding in just filling the full range um, adding in six percent seven percent for the commercial side was put on the table but ultimately um I, I think some members of the pdt got a little antsy about those those numbers getting a little bit higher than what they were comfortable with but um uh, but yeah it was admittedly ad hoc uh justification for c and d and kind of the the aligning of the numbers that came about for d was purely circumstantial and did, wasn't learned until after the fact 
thanks, Mike. I, I guess I just wanted to weigh in, and, and that was the reason why I asked that question about whether or not that explanation about option D was included in the document, because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but options A through C all fall within the commercial fishery has harvested that number of fish at some point. So I think the highest commercial harvest in the time series in your table two is 81,766 pounds, right? I uh, don't have it up right now, but I would believe you for that, that being so the number. So I think, you know, to Adam's point, options A through C all, you know, reflect something that basically has happened has happened, whereas option D is definitely reaching beyond the highest harvest that we've recorded since 2000. Um, so maybe that one becomes a little bit more arbitrary, but it's less arbitrary when you consider that it is, um, you know, it's that proportional increase to both sectors. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. And Adam, did you have any follow-up? Yeah, I think I would just offer that whatever of these options we choose to leave in out of C and D, um, if there's anything else we can offer along the lines of the argument you just made for C, I think it would be helpful for the public to understand where these came from other than just they were ad hoc. I, I think we would I think we would do ourselves well if we could add something a little bit more descriptive than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam. Does anybody else have any um, questions or, or comments on the draft addendum? Don't see. I don't see okay, thank you, Tony. So I, I think at this point, um, what I would be looking for is a motion um, to approve this for public comment. So I'll go on mute and see what happens. I see, excuse me, I have uh, Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Chris Bat Savage. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve draft addendum one uh, to the Kobe FMP for public comment as modified today. Great, thank you. And it, is there a second? See, um, lots of names. Um, I saw Malcolm Rhodes first. Okay, we'll give it to uh, Dr. Rhodes. Okay, and I'm gonna, is there is there any discussion on this motion? Don't see any hands. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and read the motion into the record. It is moved to approve COBIA draft addendum one to amendment one uh, for public comment as modified today. Motion by Mr. Bad Savage, second by Dr. Rhodes. And I think what I would like to do is call this question by consensus. Is there any opposition uh, to this motion? If yes, raise your hand. I don't see any opposition, Lynn. Okay, see no opposition. Addendum one is approved by consent. Thank you very much. It was a good discussion. Uh, so I think with that, we're going to move on to the next agenda item, which talks about uh, the the trigger calculation. And I know that Mike just went through that. Um, and as a reminder, the options, the addendum will essentially codify the methodology for calculating the trigger going forward, but we still need to do it um, for 20, uh, 2021 um, because we haven't done that yet. So we're gonna let uh, Angela Giuliano um, go through uh, the trigger setting mechanism uh, right now. Okay, go ahead, Angela. 
Lynn, really quickly, just before we go there, um, I just wanted to let board members think about, for public hearings, they will all be webinar-based um, for this document. And so I just, um, we're going to reach out to you all via email about having your hearings, but we wanted you to think about whether or not you wanted your hearings to be pair, you know, paired up with other states, focused on just for your state, um, looking at it in regional aspect or anything like that. So just think about those things. And um, when we reach out via email, we can discuss it with the states. Oh, yeah, thanks, Tony. That's, you know, that's a really good point since we're not having to have stakeholders drive, maybe we can do some consolidation. So um, absolutely. And I assume you want people, is there a date by which you want people to contact you with hearing logistics? Um, I will shoot an email out to folks um, asking the different things, the different questions that we need from them and put a date in the email that I send out to them. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. All right. So moving on. Um, Angela, Juliana, take it away. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I guess this will be a pretty short presentation. Mike has already gone through some of the methods. So I guess we go to my only slide. <laughs> Um, as Mike mentioned in his presentation, um, the technical committee has proposed an alternative method for calculating the commercial trigger. Um, as he said, the previous harvest limit of 50,000 pounds never really allowed the uh, observed harvest to get close to the new quota of 146,000 pounds. Um, so just a quick reminder again, um, the trigger was calculated using the average daily harvest rate from 2015 to 2019, which is the most recent five-year period. Um, and the total number of days um, for the season was calculated here using the date of first observed cobia harvest, which in all years was um, early January, um, to the last day of reported harvest for that year. Um, so once we had that average daily harvest rate, that was multiplied by 30 days, which is the minimum number of days required in the FMP for the commercial fishery closure. Um, walking through the proposed calculation, um, we have our total commercial quota here of 146,232 pounds. Um, if you take out the 3% that's set aside for de minimis commercial seats, um, your non-de minimis quota works out to be 141,845 pounds. Um, the average daily harvest rate was pretty low. It was um, 214 pounds per day. So multiplying that by 30 days, um, estimated harvest over 30 days would be 6,424 pounds, resulting in the commercial fishery closure being proposed as 135,422 pounds. Um, and then just for the board's um, information while they're considering the proposed trigger, the current harvest at this point for the non de minimis states as of Friday was 29,488 pounds. And that is what I have. So I guess if there are any questions, I can take those now. Thank and as Lynn you. said, uh, I was just going to add, as Lynn said, this is the last part I think of the harvest specification for the 2020 fishing year so right yes thank you Angela so are there any questions for Angela about this so it looks like right now where we where Mike went over the general methodology we're now looking at a specific number of a quota trigger that is 135,000 uh, the screen just went away so it was 135,422 Maybe it's what I remember seeing. So are there any questions for uh, Angela? I don't see any hands raised, Lynn. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, I do. Um, first, we have Doug Haymans. Okay, Doug, go ahead. Can you back that slide up, please? So, I mean, this is current quota as as, um, as a status quo, but it's not 
component that may be after we pass it into one. So that which is drastically different. Are we being asked to do something here based on the current quote of 135,422 pounds as a trigger when both Virginia and North Carolina promised to try to restrain their commercial to the 50,000 pound quota until we could get it done to one through? I'm not quite sure what we're being asked to do here. Mike, I'm going to defer that to, to you. Sure. So, we have a quota that is specified right now, and part of the process of specifying a quota is establishing a trigger. I understand that uh, Virginia and North Carolina uh, have decided that they're going to manage their fisheries to close at, I think it was 75,000, somewhere around 75,000 pounds. Uh, I understand that they've, just made that decision, but that was a decision that was made for their specific state fisheries. From the perspective of the quota set by the commission, this is how the trigger would end up being. And, and it's also, this is what the methodology for calculating it would be moving forward. Um, so yes, if addendum one, when it's passed, if the commercial quota changes, then it would need to be recalculated according to the quota, uh, according to whatever the commercial quota is that's decided by addendum one. And that would likely go into timeline uh, just a little bit later in the agenda, but that would likely be something to go into effect for the 2021 fishing year. Does that answer your question, Doug? It does. I'm just trying to think through what does it look like if it's at 54,000 pounds? That means that the trigger is somewhere around 48,000 pounds if it were a 54,000 pound quota and, and and how quickly that might close. I, I guess, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm used to the council, from the council perspective, when we talk about triggers and potential closures, we see projected dates and whatnot. And I'm trying to, to figure out exactly what this commercial trigger is going to do to the length of the season? So I, I think I can say it another way, Doug. I, this trigger will it will not be hit. It's all it's it's almost assured that we will not hit the commercial trigger this year. And you could say that this action is maybe slightly out of sync, you know, with, with our management trajectory since we're just doing draft addendum one. But if we don't take this action, and if we don't take this action, then we won't have a trigger at all. And that is, you know, in violation of the plan. And the reason that we're using this methodology sure. is because the methodology can't be, it's a little bit of a, of a circular argument, the methodology can't be used because the quota for the 2020 fishing year is, is high. Yeah, I, 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 under, I understand that. Uh, when you say we most assuredly won't hit the quota, is that the 75,000 pound gentleman's agreement or is that the 146,000 pounds that's in the current plan? And that uh, is the, the 146, sorry. sorry. Correct. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll defer back to Mike, but I was speaking about the trigger that Angela presented. Yeah, and, and we went, we're, it will be very unlikely that we hit the 135 either. Um, Lynn, you have Pat Gear with his hand raised. I think maybe he can provide a little clarity in terms of what Virginia and their gentleman's agreement quota might be. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. Go ahead, Pat. All right, thank you, Tony. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, as you, I mean, it's a shame we don't have the minutes from the last meeting because, as you recall, we had we we took a time out. We we had some discussions. Chris and I had some discussions, and then it was discussed during the, during the meeting that I believe it's seventy thousand pounds. Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but we agreed that this number, this hundred and forty-six or one hundred thirty-five thousand pounds, was 
was much more than, you know, we, we didn't want to see that. It wasn't expected. So we were shooting for around what the average was for the last few years. So we agreed on, it is a gentleman's agreement of 70,000 pounds. We are monitoring it weekly and uh, we plan, the, you know, we plan to close when, when, the, when it reaches that level. So it's, a, you know, no, no one's intent is to harvest 135,000 pounds of, of cobia commercially this year. But because you know we need to have it, we need to have a value for this year. And since the addendum isn't done yet, we have no other option, or we don't have any value at all. Doug, is that getting you straight? That's, that's one half. Uh, yeah, I, it, it is getting me straight, I, and I appreciate that. Uh, if Perhaps Mr. Bat Savage could sort of speak to the same that, that it looks like North Carolina's within their agreed upon range as well. I appreciate it. Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, as, uh, as Pat mentioned, both North Carolina and Virginia are monitoring uh, our landings on a weekly basis. Um, and it looks like we're I don't know if we're on track or slightly behind where we were last year um, at this time, um, but there, there there doesn't appear to be uh, any any chance of of, of catching the 146,000. Uh, since we're monitoring things on a weekly basis, uh, we we can we can uh, you know put the brakes on um, on the landings before they. They exceed what we're what we agreed to, and I think I think the official number is seventy three thousand, but I'd, I'd have to go back and look too. It's somewhere between seventy and seventy five for sure. Yeah. Um, but but so 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 far we're uh, us and there doesn't nothing has really popped out from our landings or from Virginia land, Virginia's landings uh, out of the ordinary that we've seen in the last few years. Thanks. Uh, Pat, I, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just want. Yeah, uh, uh, Chris is right. It's seventy-three thousand. I apologize. I look. I just thought it. Um, it is seventy. It wasn't seventy as I mentioned. Seventy-three thousand pounds. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Are, are there any other uh, questions about about this trigger? I don't see any hands, Lynn. Okay, so what we'll need here is a motion um, to approve the commercial closure trigger. Um, and I, so I'm just gonna go ahead and it's for the 2020 fishing year, correct? Correct, and um, I have had some conversations with some board members that have had kind of a concern about locking a number in for long-term. Um, even though we have a harvest quota that is specified, there's nothing in the uh, amendment that would suggest that we have to have the trigger in lockstep with that, especially knowing that it can it there's a decent chance that it changes uh, by the next meeting. So, uh, so it can be specified just for 2020. And then after addendum one is uh, completed, any changes to that uh, can be incorporated and the trigger can be recalculated for 2021. Perfect, thanks Mike. So, right, we'll need a motion to approve the trigger um, for the 2020 fishing year. And once again, I'll go on mute and wait to see what Lynn, we have Pat Gears hand up. I'm not sure if it's a question or a firm motion. No, this is a motion. Thanks Pat, go ahead. Okay, I think we already have all of it, but it's uh, moved to approve Cobia commercial trigger of 135,422 pounds for 2020. If the commercial harvest estimated through in season monitoring meets or exceeds this amount, a coastwide commercial closure for the remainder of this year will begin 30 days later. Bell, Bell. I was going to second it. All right, second by Mr. Bell. 
Great. Is there any discussion on the motion? Just a brief edit. Um, as I heard it from Pat, Maya, if we could delete in any year after amount. <laughs> And when we keep that, you have um, Doug, Pat, and Mel with their hands up. Okay, so we'll go alphabetically. So, Doug, do you have a comment on the motion? Does it have to read the actual poundage, or can it not read the method? Does the motion have to have the pounds, or can it not be the method that's used for the trigger? I think we need a number, Mike. Yes, the trigger is an actual number. The methodology is being considered for inclusion in the plan through addendum one. But in order to like in order to apply a trigger to a to a quota within a year, it would need to be a number or a percent of the quota. Doug, do you have a follow-up to that? No, I'll be, I'll shut up, I'm okay. Thank All right. Um, did, Pat, did you want to speak to the motion or did your hand go down? No, my hand went down, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. And, and Mel Bell, did your hand also go down? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. So I think at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and read the motion into the record. Move to approve a COBIA commercial trigger of 135,422 pounds for 2020 if commercial harvest estimated through in season monitoring meets or exceeds this amount. A coastwide commercial closure for the remainder of the year will begin 30 days later. Motion by Mr. Gear, second by Mr. Bell. And I think at this point, what I'm going to do is try to do this again by consensus. Um, if, is, if, there's, if anyone opposes this motion, please raise your hand. Lynn, I don't see anybody with their hand up. I just wanted to double check to make sure you didn't want to ask the public if they wanted to comment on this motion since it didn't go out for public comment. Yeah, I, thank you. I think that's a, a really good idea. So I'm going to put a pause there and just go ahead. Is there anybody in the public who wants to speak to this? And again, for the public to raise your hand, you just... Um, click on that little hand button on the, and I don't see anybody raising their hand, Lynn. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. So we'll try it again then. So if anybody is opposed to this motion, um, please raise your hand. I see no hands raised. Great. Okay, then this motion is approved by consensus and it'll be a little more straightforward um, next year once this draft addendum is done. And I guess that brings us to our next item that segues well, where we will talk about the timeline um, for implementing COBIA implementation plans. And I think, Mike, with that, I'll go back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once Maya is ready to pull up the presentation, I got just a couple slides giving some description. Thanks, Maya. We can go ahead and advance to the next one. So I sent out a memo in supplemental materials, but uh, wanted to address it with the board because we have. Um, we have upcoming some pretty tight timelines. Uh, so in February, uh, amend, uh, excuse me, February was not when Amendment 1 was uh, approved. It was approved earlier, but in uh, February, we had a new harvest quota that was uh, approved. Um, and Amendment 1, when it was approved last fall, 
Uh, it was scheduled for implementation by July 1st. Um, kind of in follow-up to that, we had that new harvest uh, that new harvest quota that was approved in February, and there were some parts of evaluating implementation that were put on hold because of that, because states were allowed to carry over their regulations from 2019 into 2020 as far as recreational seasons, vessel limits are concerned, and achieving state uh, harvest targets. So we have some outstanding implementation evaluations that uh, that need to occur. Obviously, there have been uh, impacts uh, to the world and there have been attentions diverted to other things, but um, looking towards 2021, it was the goal from the 2020, uh, from the February 2020 meeting to have recreational measures under the current quota in place for 2021. So, uh, since then, we've had updates to the timeline regarding Draft Addendum 1 and Draft Addendum 1 will impact uh, what well, has potential to impact the quotas um, that would be considered for final approval in October 2020. One thing to note about this is that, yes, it could change the quotas and uh, subsequently the recreational harvest targets, but it's not going to change them by very much. We're talking, uh, you know, a percent, a you know, couple or a few percent at most. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring to the attention of the board and that uh, the states could have their staff, their staffs working on is developing their implementation plans, particularly those states that have harvest targets. Um, I, I would hope that there would be some uh, communication among uh, the agencies to develop those plans so that they can be evaluated pretty quickly after addendum one is considered and uh, possibly approved. Uh, next slide, please. So looking forward at the process of uh, how how new measures could uh, potentially go into place for, 20, for 2021. Um, after the October meeting, as long as states are committed and willing to uh, begin working on it probably soon ahead of even the uh, annual meeting and then, you know, be in a place where small adjustments could potentially be made based on the results of Addendum 1. Uh, implementation plans could be due to the TC by mid-November. Uh, the TC would then, uh, they would need probably a couple weeks to review those um, and meet via webinar to review those in early December and then if uh, if the board wants to have a decision made before 2021, then there would need to be board consideration either via email or or a, uh, a South Atlantic board specific webinar in mid December. Um, if either of these options are desired, it just it needs to be stated and agreed upon um, on the record. Uh, it, that's something that could be decided today. Uh, probably better to do it earlier than later to have that decision and folks can make the plans for it, but it, it is something that would need to be uh, stated publicly and agreed upon. Um, and then states would uh, would also need to be begin preparing as soon as possible for a, what is a pretty aggressive timeline. Uh, this was throwing out an idea of a way to make it happen before 2021 if the board, if the states would like to be more aggressive in the timeline to make it happen, or if, you know, with the recognition that several of the uh, of the seasons don't start until the spring, uh, there may be a little bit of wiggle room, but um, I, I, if I interpreted what uh, the board's desire was from February correctly, the board wanted to have the new recreational measures, any new recreational any new measures based off of the new recreational quota, particularly in place for 2021. Um, so that's all I had on that. And uh, just uh, I'll pass it back to you, Madam Chair, for um, hearing discussion and what the board's plans and commitments are as we move into the fall. Okay, thanks for that, Mike. Yes, yeah, so it, it, it's backing us into an aggressive timeline. So just just to repeat, you know, what Mike said and what we need discussion on is we need to come to, this is not an action item, but we need to come to agreement if we can 
um, that we're going to work to get addendum one um, measures in place for 2021, which means we would need to follow the timeline on the screen. So with that, I will uh, put it up for discussion. We, sorry, Lynn, I don't see any hands. Oh, nope, we got Pat here. Okay, Pat, and then I see Chris Beth Savage on deck. So, uh, Pat, go ahead. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the concerns I have with this is that, um, you're not mentioning this, but we also have Spot and Croker, where you're going to have some issues as well. So, having both you know, this and Elena Croker coming up at the same time. Um, how much of an issue that's going to be for us? You know, a lot of in, in a lot of the, in my state, you know, the people working on Kobe are also working on Scott and Croker. So, you know, let's um, trying to get this all done. You know, Mike, you sent out a, you sent out a, a, a letter to us explaining the timeline for that as well. So, could you elaborate on the timeline for the um, Croker and Scott and, and how it overlaps with this? Sure, if you bear with me one second, I'm just going to pull up the the memo that I sent so I can make sure I'm not contradicting myself as much as possible. Um, so the timeline for Spot and Croker is a, is a little bit less clear. The um, reason for that is, uh, as was stated in the memo that was sent out, one of the surveys the chess map survey one of the surveys that uh that spot and croaker were kind of depending on especially for that mid-atlantic region for determining abundance in the tla um, that underwent some changes to the survey we the survey was conducted it just needs to be recalibrated and that recalibration process is taking a while um and it the most recent update that we have is that it will not be available until the end of the year. So the TLA will need to be conducted without the chess map survey and the Croker and Spot TCs are going to need to talk about how to do that um, and talk about what, you know, whether they're going to potentially replace it with NEMAP or if they just run it with only the, the Northeast Fishery Science Center survey in the Mid-Atlantic region or what strategy they would take. Um, but there is the possibility that the removal of chess map, um, you know, when, when we were going into Croker in particular, uh, when chess map was in consideration, um, the results were kind of predetermined for Croker that it would trigger this year. And with the removal of chess map, I'm not sure I, I would need to check with, uh, I believe Chris McDonough has run it a couple different ways, but it would be, it, I don't know at this point what the result would be for Croker. And there was some uncertainty as far as spot on whether a trigger would occur. Um, there were some, you know, scenarios where it could or it couldn't. And so I think part of that timeline depends on what exactly is triggering. One of the advantages for Croker and Spot is that the management responses are, as I recall, a bit more prescriptive uh, based off of Addendum 3 to each of those plans. They're kind of spelled out in the plans. And also there wouldn't be uh, there wouldn't be as much, there would be you know implementation plans that would need to be submitted but there wouldn't need to be as much, I guess, analysis evaluation for the Spot and Croker implementation plans as there would be for the Cobia plans. Because again, the Spot and Croker is a bit more prescriptive. It's spelled out and it's not really trying to, um, it, it, there are some states that are already meeting uh, those requirements as well. So. I, I, that's not a great answer to the question, but it's it's hard to say right now without having the results of the TLA. No, Mike, thanks. I appreciate that. And I, I was honestly secretly hoping that this wouldn't come up 
Um, but so that in my what I think we need to do, and and Pat, I I really appreciate your um, appeal that you've got staff doubled up on these species. But I, I get the sense that what we're going to need to do is take this one at a time. So we have a clear path with cobia, spot and croaker. You know the TC hasn't met yet. They haven't had the discussions about what to do with the fact that we're going to see a traffic light analysis that has sort of a, a switch off in data. I, you know, I, I think there are some issues there that the board is really going to need to discuss in October. And in October, you know, we might be two boards. Um, I don't know, but I think we need to really um, put Spot and Croker on the table for October and hear what the TC has to say and see what those analyses look like and take it from there recognizing you know what the workloads of our respective staffs are you know i think that's about the best we can do of right now um chris that savage did, did you have a, a comment uh yes uh, thanks madam chair um i think we'll start with a question on implementation for cobia um yes with the new uh, heart you have the new quota that we have in in 2020 um the the harvest targets for you know, the the non de minimis states for the recreational fishery have all changed the numbers of fish have gone up and they may change again depending on the outcome of, of addendum one uh, meanwhile our, our regulations currently in place are based on old mrip um, and the previous stock assessment so there's a bit of a disconnect there uh, in terms of uh, you know the current current and future targets versus our regs. So a question for Mike is for the implementation plans. Would will the states have the opportunity to modify their their regulations like seasons or vessel limits or anything like that uh, that better align with uh, the the new targets? Yes, that that's I, I think that's kind of the intent um, of the upcoming implementation. As I remember from the February meeting, the states had concern about being able to get that process done ahead of the fishing season this year. Um, and, and I know at least a few of the states, I think probably most of the states at this point, when you consider all the states that are using the same regs as Virginia, um, many states, their their season doesn't start in January for the recreational fishery. So, I mean, we, there is a little bit of time and consideration for that. And there's also been, you know, the time since then to consider what to do in place for 2021. But yes, that, I mean, there would be, the states would be given new harvest targets and the task for the states would be come up with the season and vessel limit that fits this harvest target um, as, as you want to apply it to your to your fisheries. So yes, there could be change from the regulations of previous years. Great, thanks Mike. I, I thought that was the case and kind of get confused as far as you know when, when, when the timing for that allows, but that also helps in terms of trying to figure out what we need to do in terms of an implementation plan and, and the uh, pretty aggressive timeline we need to do. Uh, just, a, I guess, a comment on, you know, whether to meet by webinar or by email in, in December. I think uh, one challenge we're going to face is, uh, is just other meetings already on the books. And I believe the South Atlantic Council meets the first week of December and the Mid Atlantic Council meets the second week of December. And then we quickly go into the holidays. So. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, if, if we could do this by email, that, that might be one option. Or I know it's really pushing it in terms of getting things in place by 2021, but, on, you know, early January webinar. But just I just wanted to flag the, those two um, council meetings that are already on the schedule in December. It might make it a little, a little tougher to do uh, with the timeline. Thanks. 
Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks for um, highlighting those meetings. I think that's helpful. Uh, okay, so I, I think where we are right now is we need to um, state on the record that uh, as a body, we're on board with this timeline. Is there, does anybody else have any um, commentary on this? Okay. I'm not seeing hands. Yeah, me neither. So I think at that point then, um, Mike, what we're going to do um, for your benefit is just state on the record that, um, you know, the board is uh, ready and willing to follow um, the timeline that you propose so that we'll be um, ready to implement addendum one for the 2021 fishing season. Um, okay, Tony, does that work as far as like that statement on the record that works for being able to conduct whatever review by the board, email or webinar? Yep, that'll work. Um, and we'll work with the states to determine if we think we can figure out a time to do it via webinar, and if not, we'll um, have to do it via email. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So now, I think next, um, and this is gonna be our final action item for the meeting, we are gonna go on to something completely different, um, which is Red Drum to talk about the terms of reference um, for a simulation study. So with that, I think what I'm gonna do is hand it over to Jeff Kipp. Thank you, Madam Chairman. To outline my presentation, I'll be covering the terms of reference for the simulation assessment process for Red Drum. And these define the scope of work to be accomplished by the stock assessment subcommittee and technical committee during the assessment. I'll then cover the terms of reference for the external peer review, which are going to be similar in language to these assessment TORs, but they direct the peer review panel to evaluate the SAS and TC fulfillment of the assessment TORs. And then I'll just wrap up with a uh, summary of the timeline of the major milestones during the simulation assessment process. So for the terms of reference for the simulation assessment process, 2R1 is to describe fishery dependent and fishery independent monitoring programs for Red Drum and the data sets produced from these monitoring programs for stock assessment characterize precision and accuracy of data sets. 2R2 is to describe available information for parameterizing simulation models, characterize uncertainty of parameters. 2R3 is to develop methods to project a simulated population through time implement sampling procedures and simulation models to generate data sets, mirroring data sets available from existing monitoring programs. 204, TOR4 is to develop simulated populations that incorporate uncertainty and information used to parameterize the simulation models, characterize uncertainty and limitations in simulated models, and potential impacts on perceived understanding of NC2 population dynamics and stock status. TOR5 is to develop candidate assessment methods and apply assessment methods to data sets sampled from simulated populations. TOR6 is to define reference points for characterizing stock status of simulated populations. TOR7 is to identify performance metrics and evaluate performance of each candidate assessment method for estimating the population dynamics and stock status of simulated populations. Describe strengths and weaknesses of each assessment method. TOR8 is to recommend the preferred assessment method or methods for characterizing stock status. And the final TOR, TOR9, is to provide prioritized recommendations on future monitoring to approve assessment. 
Now moving to the terms of reference for the external peer review. TOR1 is to evaluate thoroughness of data collection, data treatment, data presentation, and characterization of data uncertainty. TOR2 is to evaluate thoroughness and appropriateness of information used to parameterize simulation models. TR3 is to evaluate the appropriateness of simulation models for simulating red drum populations and generating data sets sampled from these simulated populations. TR4 is to evaluate the incorporation and treatment of uncertainty in simulated populations. TR5 is to evaluate candidate assessment methods and application of assessment methods to data sets sampled from simulated populations. TR6 is to evaluate choice of reference points for characterizing stock status of simulated populations, recommend alternatives if necessary. TOR7 is to evaluate choice of performance metrics used to evaluate performance of each candidate assessment method for estimating the population dynamics and stock status of simulated populations, recommend alternatives if necessary. TOR8 is to evaluate the choice of the preferred assessment method or methods for characterizing stock status, recommend alternatives if necessary. TOR9 is to review recommendations on future monitoring provided by the Technical Committee and comment on the appropriateness and prioritization of each recommendation, provide any additional recommendations warranted. And then the final uh, TOR for the peer review panel is TOR10, prepare a peer review panel terms of reference and advisory report summarizing the panel's evaluation of the simulation assessment and addressing each peer review term of reference develop a list of tasks to be completed following the workshop, complete and submit the report within four weeks of workshop conclusion. So now moving on to a summary of the timeline. So uh, in this table here are the major milestones of the assessment. Uh, the full uh, proposed assessment timeline was provided in meeting materials. Uh, but the first item is what we're doing currently, uh, board review of the terms of reference which will uh, initially, uh, uh, will formally initiate the stock assessment. We have a data deadline proposed for October of this year. Our first workshop will be a data methods workshop, and that will be uh, in November. And then we'll have uh, two modeling workshops uh, occurring in 2021, the first in February and the second in June. The TC will meet to review what the stock assessment subcommittee put together in the stock assessment in January of 2022. And then we'll uh, tentatively schedule the peer review workshop for March of 2022. And then we'll bring the board and peer review, um, sorry, the assessment and the peer review of that assessment to the board for consideration uh, at the ASMFC spring meeting in 2022. And then just a couple notes here. Um, we will provide updates to the board at each ASMFC me meeting between this current meeting and the meeting when we present the assessment in May of 2022. And then the current plan is to initiate a traditional benchmark stock assessment with separate TURs following board consider consideration of the simulation assessment in May of 2022. So that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions on those. Thank you, Jeff, very much. I think this is going to be a really um, interesting project and hopefully give us some of those insights that we've been missing with Red Drum and help us uh, manage this fishery. So are there questions for Jeff? I don't see any questions, Lynn. Okay, so I think as a reminder, um, this this is an action item, and we oh Doug, I see your hand go up. 
So the, the third part, the third member of the Georgia delegation would like to ask a question. Dr. Felcher would like to chime in, if that's okay. Uh, please go ahead. So just because I haven't been um, in the discussions relative to this, how does this fit into the traditional approach that we've done with continuity run assessments and then working towards a new benchmark? Because um, the concerns that I have is I'm thinking about continuity and knowing that our current model does not have or has not been adapted to the new MRIC numbers. Um, so I'm not really sure how that is going to affect or tie in with that evaluation of the parameters because all the parameters that we currently have are run based on those older numbers. Yeah, so we will be using the updated new MRIP data in this simulation process. And basically what we're going to do is, is build a simulation model based on those, those data sets, including the new MRIP numbers, and then information we know about the population, such as, you know, what we believe the natural mortality rates are, growth rates, et cetera. And that way we can develop and simulate known populations with known population parameters. And then the, the next part of this assessment will be to apply various assessment methods to data sets we draw from those known populations. So we're going to use, we are likely going to use the current assessment model um, as one of those assessment methods as a candidate. And since we will know what the population parameters are of these simulated populations, we can uh, evaluate the performance of this the current assessment model and any other assessment approaches we want to try here to see what are the most robust for red drum populations so um, so we will be using those new mrip data and all the other observed data sets that we have available such as the survey indices uh, in this simulation model to simulate uh, information for for assessing does that answer your question? Yeah, so then the other part of that is just so like the spawner recruit relationship, is that something that's going to come out of that last assessment? Because if there's a scaling issue between the new MRIP numbers and the old MRIP numbers, those parameters are not going to match well. So we will meet to determine what parameters we have, what we have to choose from, and that will drive the the structure of this simulation model. All of those things will probably evalu evaluate with some level of uncertainty in them. So for example, if we do pull stock recruit parameters from the past assessment or any other assessments that occurred before the most recent, we would uh, parameterize the uncertainty of those parameters as well and sort of draw from distributions to uh, capture the uncertainty in those parameters in the simulation model. So it will involve how, how well we know those parameters, how well we think we know those parameters, and we will sort of um, bring the uncertainty in those through the simulation model. Are you going to still evaluate with the two separate regions as well? I believe that will probably be the plan. We'll uh, address that probably at the data workshop, but um, you know, at this point, one of the first things we'll be doing is gathering information and particularly information that's occur that's come online since the last stock assessment. So I think if there is anything to suggest a different stock structure, we would address it at that data workshop. Um, but I believe currently that there's probably nothing new to push us in that direction to a new stock structure. Who's um who's gonna do the assessment? I was just curious because I know Mike Murphy's been our our historic um, assessor, but are we do we have an idea on who's going to be um, leading this? So we have gone out and repopulated the stock system subcommittee. There's been a, a bit of turnover. Um, we've got folks from pretty much all the states. Uh, we've got Joey Ballinger as the stock assessment subcommittee chair. And then we've got analysts from Georgia, Jared Flowers, um, from Florida, Chris Swanson, um, from North Carolina, Tom Tears, uh, and then from um, Maryland, Angela Giuliano, and then myself on that stock assessment subcommittee. Um, and then Lee Paramore is also the technical committee chair, so a de facto 
stock assessment subcommittee members. So those are the analysts on the stock assessment subcommittee. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Are there, at this point, any other questions for Jeff about the terms of reference for this simulation study? I don't see any other hands, Lynn. Okay. So, again, we are going to need a motion to approve these terms of reference. So, um, this is the last time I will go on mute and um, see what we get. Anybody out there willing to make a motion to approve the terms of reference? Mel Bell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, move to approve the terms of reference and schedule for the 2022 Red Drum Simulation Assessment as presented. Great. Thank you, Melon. Is there a second? We have um, lots of names now. Jim Estes. All right. Second by Mr. Estes. Is there any discussion on the motion? I have Mel's hand up, but I, it might be from now it's down, so no no hands up. Okay. All right. So I will read the motion into the record. It is moved to approve terms of reference for the red drum simulation assessment as presented. Motion by Mr. Bell, second by Mr. Estes. Um, and once again, if I'm going to try to do this by um, consensus, so if, if there is anybody who is opposed to this motion, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands. All right, very good. Seeing no opposition, this motion stands approved by consensus. And I, I do believe. Um, because we have stricken the vice chair election from the record pending the decision on uh, what to do with this board, um, that concludes our agenda, except um, that I do have one addition, and I know that everybody's aware that Dr. Mike Schmicke is um, headed down to South Carolina, um, so he will no longer be working for the commission, and I just want to say that it has been a tremendous pleasure to work with him. He is sharp and professional, um, and the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council um, is lucky to get him, and I know that we're not all together so that we, it's hard to do a big round of applause um, virtually, but I, I know that you are all sitting behind your computers right now clapping um, in appreciation for the work that Mike has done. Um, yeah. So uh, with that, and Mike, thank you. And um, with that, uh, is there any opposition to adjourning this meeting? I don't see any opposition. Thank you, Lynn. And, and thank you for saying, you know, those nice words about Mike and we here at the commission are gonna greatly miss him. Uh, South Atlantic Council is getting a, a great staff member. Uh, and then, Lynn, I think Bob has something to say as well. Absolutely. Bob Beal, please go ahead. Thanks, Lynn. Appreciate it. Um, just two quick things. One is, yeah, all the best to Mike, and um, I'm glad we get to keep working with him at the South Atlantic Council. Um, and we can solve some Spanish mackerel problems and, and other things that we didn't talk about today. Um, I just sent an email around to all the commissioners and proxies about the storm that's kind of wandering up the east coast now it's kind of unclear you know what's going to happen it's, it's not the strongest of storms that we've seen but it's still a pretty high-end tropical storm so you know there may be um heavy rains and and winds and some power outages and those sorts of things so we're just gonna you know we're, i'll work with pat kelleher we'll keep an eye on it if we need you know if, if a significant number of commissioners are unable to participate in a meeting we'll We'll take that into consideration and, and we may adjust schedules as needed. You know, we're gonna try not to cancel anything. We may you know, slide some things back until later in the week, but we'll just have to see. You know, the good news is 
for Menhaden, which starts tomorrow, we've got you know Wednesday afternoon to wrap that up. So it's a tomorrow is kind of a non-decisional meeting on on Menhaden. Striped bass um, is a big meeting tomorrow. So we'll just have to keep an eye on it. If anyone knows, they you know if your power goes out and you're able to get in touch with Tony and I, let us know. Or if somebody in your delegation can't participate, let us know and we'll adjust as necessary. But hopefully we make it through without having to shake things up too much. So thank you, Madam Chair. And absolutely. To add to that, Lynn, um, for folks, you know, along with power, out power outages usually goes internet outages, but I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, GoToWebinar does have an app for your cell phones. And so um, you can easily download that and then you'd be able to see presentations, communicate, talk on your phones. And if you're having trouble, you know, with the internet connection on your phone at all, you can also just call into the meeting. There's instructions on how to do that. Um, so if you wanted to pull that stuff off of your, off the web page now, um, like writing down the meeting code and all of those things to prepare or just in case something happens tomorrow, that'd be great. Otherwise, just um, you can always give me a call at the office. It forwards to my cell phone and I can talk you through and walk you through all these different options. Okay, thanks, Bob and Tony. Hopefully, the, we're all going to um, get through the storm. Everybody stay safe. And um, with that, we'll uh, move on to the next thing. Oh. Lynn, um, Doug Hamans has his um, hand up. I, I was just going to say that we have sat here today through starting with whatever we started with this morning. And I've watched the storm pass the Georgia coast. And if it's anything like what came by here, I think you still need to keep your sprinklers running over the weekend or during the week. We got less than a half an inch of rain and a light breeze. Well, we will all hope for that. Yep. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you, everybody.